OK, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and uh, so, so this, is, uh, this is not a deep talk. This is a broad talk. It's supposed to be a kind of lightning uh, review and overview of where we stand in terms of intrinsics and metadata and attributes and a number of the things that have been added over the past few years uh, for a variety of different purposes. And so the, I'm going to start off the talk by just giving an overview of what these things are, for those of you who aren't intimately familiar. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, incremental improvements and some new features that have been made uh, over the past couple of years, uh, including some uh, rep representational changes uh, in, in, well, at least in metadata itself. OK. OK. Uh, so the, I have a couple of slides of background, uh, one for intrinsics, one's for metadata, one's for attributes. So, okay, so uh, just uh, for those of you who don't, who don't already know, uh, LLVM supports intrinsics. Uh, intrinsics are things that look like functions. Uh, they have a special name. They all start with LLVM dot something or other. And these are special functions. They're not functions you have to define. Uh, they are functions you have to declare. but. Uh, at least syntactically speaking. But uh, the semantics of these functions, their meaning is defined internally by the compiler. Uh, and so LLVM now has a lot of these things. In fact, if you include all the target-specific intrinsics, there are hundreds of them, uh, at least. Uh, but, but the idea is that not all of the intrinsics are target-specific, although many of them are. There is a whole class of target-independent intrinsics uh, that have special meanings and they are used to access a lot of features of LLVM. OK, uh, so, so what are attributes? Well, there are a number of different kinds of attributes. Attributes are also things that go along with functions. Uh, they can go along with the functions themselves, or they can go along with specific function attributes, uh, with specific function arguments. Uh, and, uh, and, and furthermore, uh, they there are, there are two kinds of these things. One kind I've shown on the slide here, which are these built-in attributes. They are things that are part of the grammar of LLVM. Uh, like here on this slide, uh, you can see that there is this function foo, and it has an attribute no unwind. Uh, and the argument uh, a has uh, an attribute by val on it, uh, which says that uh, the function takes that argument by value. The exact meaning of that is actually defined by the back end you're using. But uh, these, these are properties of the function or the, or the argument. Uh, they are understood natively by the, the compiler. Uh, you can also have attributes uh, on functions that are sort of arbitrary strings. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that, that later. Uh, and then the, the, third, uh, the third thing that, that we're going to talk about uh, over this half hour are, uh, is metadata. Uh, so, so metadata is, is special compared to uh, the previous two uh, things or, of intrinsics or, uh, or attributes uh, in, in the sense that, that metadata is designed to be, uh, it's designed to serve as, as optimization hints primarily. Uh, the, the important thing about metadata is that the optimizer is free to drop it as it performs optimizations. So, uh, if this, so th this means that if you, you can't have metadata that carries important, necessary semantic information about your program, because the optimizer might drop it at, at some point to do some optimization, to perform some transformation. Uh, and so the kinds of things that get expressed in metadata are, um, uh, are restricted by, by, by that, that fact. Uh, the, the other thing about metadata, though, is that it's, it's fairly general. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of optimization hints you might want to uh, provide at, at various points for various different kinds of transformations. Uh, and so there's a, there's a very expressive syntax for, for metadata that can be, it can be used to encode a lot of different kinds of information. Now, syntactically in the IR, uh, metadata is uh, indicated by something with the exclamation point. And so here on this, on this slide, uh, you can see that there's this range, range metadata on a load. Uh, and that, that tells the, uh, the optimizer, well, in this case, uh, it tells the optimizer that the value being loaded is either 0 or, or 1, because um, that's be between 0 and 2, uh, but not at the endpoint. So, 
Uh, so it's a Boolean value. And the optimizer can then use that information as it optimizes the code. OK. Um, but you know, in, terms of, in terms of design, there's a, there's a spectrum here. Um, and uh, some of these things are cheaper for the optimizer to deal with, and some of them are more expensive. Representationally, in terms of memory overhead, in terms of compile time overhead, and, and, other, and other complexity. Uh, so, you know, on this spectrum, I put attributes at the top. Those are sort of the cheapest things to, to use. Um, then, then there's, uh, you know, then, then there's, there's, there's metadata. So me metadata is, um, it can be expensive sort of compile time-wise if you end up with a whole lot of it. Uh, and so you have to be careful about that. Um, but it's, it's not as uh, expensive in terms of optimization impact because the optimizer is free to drop it. Now, then there are intrinsics. Intrinsics are like function calls. And unless the optimizer knows something specific about a specific function call, then it can't just generally remove function calls. And so uh, the function calls can inhibit optimization. Um, but they're, they, they also allow you to express things that can't really be expressed with the other mechanisms. Uh, and, and quickly, I should mention, over the past uh, couple of years, uh, we now also have an, uh, uh, a fourth mechanism, uh, which can be used on, in certain circumstances called operand bundles. Uh, and these are used, uh, well, the primary use cases for these involve the optimization and other sort of JIT infrastructure uh, issues. Uh, they, they kind of fall somewhere in between on the, on the spectrum here. Uh, they can be used to encode a lot of things. They can also, they're only applicable to calls, sort of like attributes. Uh, and they can also block uh, certain optimizations, so they have some uh, optimizer impact in that regard as well. All right. So one of the things that's changed over the past couple of years is how metadata itself is represented. So metadata itself has been around in LVM for a very long time, uh, but, but we've, we've now introduced some major changes into how it's represented, both syntactically in the IR, but also in terms of the underlying data structures. Uh, and so, so here I have, I have a, a quick uh, example here uh, showing some metadata. In this case, it would be associated with a, a loop. And uh, on the top, uh, it, you can see how the metadata used to look a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see there was use of this metadata keyword uh, in front of essentially every metadata thing, uh, every me me metadata object. Um, and, and specifically, um, one thing to note is in that top line where it's defining metadata zero, uh, the, the first argument there was also metadata zero. And, and this had a side effect in the old system of preventing uniquing. So it, it prevented um, metadata with the same syntactic uh, value structure uh, from being combined together into the same value. Uh, we use this scheme uh, when we had metadata that we didn't want, that we wanted to represent a unique entity of some kind. So for example, this, this metadata that represents loops, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about later, um, we wanted each loop to have its own distinct identifier, and the metadata object served as that identifier, which means that loops that had the same, uh, you know, the same associated uh, metadata and hints and such, you didn't want just those to all be collapsed and considered to be the same loop. So what happened was by doing this self-referential metadata, uh, we were able to prevent this uniquing and have each metadata item serve as a unique identifier. But in the new scheme, just having self-referential metadata actually doesn't provide that property. And so to preserve the ability to have that property, we actually introduced a new concept uh, of distinct metadata. And this is indicated by a new keyword in the IR, which is distinct. Um, we also eliminated the metadata keyword from the metadata uh, declar you know, definitions themselves. Uh, and so you can see in the, the bottom here uh, gives uh, the, the new syntactic scheme for metadata. And you can see the use of the distinct keyword. And you can also see the lack of this metadata keyword all over the place. Um, so that's something to, 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 keep, uh, to keep in mind. Um, the other thing the, that, that we did, actually, let me just back a second. The, the, the other thing that, that we did um, was we changed metadata so that the metadata itself are not values. The, the metadata objects used to be LVMIR values, and they had use lists, and you could you know, replace uses of, 
a particular metadata object with some other metadata object or something else. Um, and, and, but part of the problem with this is that it got very expensive, uh, representationally speaking. And so uh, in, under the new scheme, the metadata values aren't value objects. Um, now, this introduced a particular kind of problem, though, because we have certain intrinsics that take metadata arguments. And the arguments need to be values. So how do we deal with that? Well, uh, we now have this metadata as value, value type um, that wraps a metadata reference and uh, provides the semantics of an LVM IR value type. And one of the interesting things about these things is these things actually do have useless, and you can replace them, and, and all the things that you would expect to be able to do with values. So you can't do, them, you can't do that anymore with metadata in general. But for, for metadata that uh, serves as uh, intrinsic uh, arguments to intrinsics, uh, you still can. Uh, you also have to realize when you're looking at, at, at arguments of functions that, that instead of just getting a metadata object directly, you'll now get one of these metadata as value objects. OK. Uh, one, one other sort of minor addition over the past uh, couple of years is that you can now put metadata on globals uh, and on function declarations and such. Um, we don't, th there, uh, here's a quick example of, of how that looks uh, syntactically in the IR. And one of the nice things about metadata is that uh, you, know, you, you can define your own metadata and use it however you want. So uh, there are, if, if this has, you know, people use these things for all sorts of things. And so uh, you know, in some, uh, for some use cases, this is, this is quite useful. Oh, I did. Okay. All right. So uh, here I have a quick summary of some of the things that I'm going to talk about for the you know during the rest of the presentation. Um, there are uh, so that you know so so you know in the I don't know two years ago I gave a, a presentation sort of an update like this and I talked about things that are in the table on the top and uh, now there are some other things that have been added and that's the table on the bottom so on this, but that's roughly where we're going. Um, OK, so, so one, one, uh, one addition that's, that's appeared recently uh, is something related to this uh, dereferenceable attribute. So before I explain that, let me just review what the dereferenceable attribute is. Uh, the dereferenceable attribute is an attribute that you can put on a, on a pointer argument that tells the optimizer uh, that from that, that pointer argument and from there, you know, n bytes, uh, you know, from there to n bytes later, uh, is guaranteed to be to be dereferenceable, to be something that the the uh, the compiler knows that it can load from, and it can do that without fear of causing uh, memory fault. So this is actually quite useful when you want to do things like hoisting um, hosting hoisting loads out of loops. And so, so here I have a, a quick example of how this attribute is used. In C++, we can put these on uh, reference-typed arguments, for example, because we know they have to point to something uh, valid. And so, um, and so this enables us to, to do this kind of, of hoisting. Now, sometimes you, uh, sometimes you have a, a, uh, a value that is a pointer, and you know it is it might be dereferenceable, but there's another option. The other option is that it's null. So you know that it's either null, and if it's not null, you know it points to something. And so uh, we now have this dereferenceable or null attribute, which uh, sort of as the name implies, uh, provides the semantics of dereferenceable, but only if you can prove that the pointer isn't null. And so this helps you in cases where you have null pointer checks and other things that you can show that in certain, you know, in the, you know, certain region of your control flow, you know the pointer isn't null. And in those regions of the control flow, you can then do the kind of hoisting that you'd like. Um, another, another new attribute that has been uh, added is the uh, alloc size uh, attribute. So uh, this, this attribute is used to annotate custom memory allocation functions. And they explain to the optimizer that the function returns allocated memory 
and it returns memory that and that allocation has at least the size uh, indicated by the some argument that has to be an integer. And so here in this case on the, the top thing, it says my malloc, and it says that the, the second argument provides the size of the allocation that's returned. Uh, you can also handle like calloc-like functions where you, the size is actually given by the multiplication of two of the arguments. Um, although you have to be somewhat careful here because um, the examples of this attribute can be somewhat misleading in this regard. Um, when you have this calloc-like um, uh, interface, there's no assumption made on the contents of the memory after it's being allocated. It only tells you about the size. So that's a note there. Um, there, there are plans to uh, use this to support the alloc size um, C-level, you know, GNU-style attribute in Clang. Um, there's a, this is under review, and so I, I assume this will be happening fairly soon. It's not quite there yet. Uh, so, okay. Uh, there are a, a number of new attributes have been added to explain the pointer aliasing and, and memory access semantics of functions that are the, uh, of external functions. Um, there, uh, again, over the past uh, couple of years. So what, one of them is argmem only. So argmem only says that the function only accesses memory that's based on the pointer typed, uh, it's pointer typed function arguments. And there are a lot of functions that, that fall into this category. Uh, we've had for a long time the ability to tag intrinsics with this property. Um, but we didn't have a way of tagging functions, just general functions, with this, with this property. Uh, and, and now we do. Um, there's, there's also a related concept that, 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 that was added, which is called inaccessible memory, uh, or inaccessible memory only uh, type functions. Uh, you can, these, but when you give a function this attribute, what you're saying is that uh, the, the function accesses, it, you know, it may access memory, it may load and store to memory or what have you, um, but it's not memory that is otherwise accessible to the module being compiled. Um, and so, well, what this means in practice is that, you know, calls to such functions uh, we, have to, to, we have to maintain the ordering of those things because they have side effects of some kind. So we can't remove them. We can't change their order relative to one another. But we do know that any memory that's under consideration, you know, any loads and stores that we can see, we know those functions don't access that memory because uh, that's, that's, that memory is otherwise accessible to us. Um, and as, as, uh, as you might imagine, we also added this attribute, which is a combination of the two, um, which says that uh, a function accesses only memory given by its arguments or memory that which represents sort of side effects, memory that we can't otherwise uh, see. And so, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of functions that occur in runtime libraries and other contexts. Uh, that satisfy these, these properties. And it's, it ends up being important to be able to tell the optimizer about these things. OK. Um, OK. So uh, an another one that uh, it falls into this category of attributes relating to pointer aliasing and side effects uh, is write-only. Uh, for a long time, we had read-only. Um, and now you know, symmetry has been restored to the world because we have write-only as well. Uh, write-only is not as common as read-only, but nevertheless, uh, there are functions that indeed only write to memory, and uh, it can be useful to be able to uh, capture that fact. The uh, one, one, one thing that's, that's important uh, to note here is that you can put write-only not only on the functions, but you can also put write-only on uh, function arguments. Um, the, the meaning of this uh, is not as strong as you might think, however, because when you put write only on the function argument, it just says that the function doesn't write to memory using any pointer based on that argument. It doesn't tell you that it doesn't write to that same memory through some other aliasing pointer that it gets some other way. Uh, so, so you have to be a little, bit, a little bit careful if you are tagging um, uh, well, if you're doing optimizations based on write only on a function argument, or, or you, ha you have to uh, uh, 
uh, perhaps regulate your, your optimism about what the compiler will be able to do by putting that argument on a function. Okay. Attribute on a function argument. Okay. Um, uh, another thing that, that we've added, which um, in some sense indirectly falls into this category of pointer aliasing related uh, attributes, although perhaps not immediately obviously so, is no recurse. Uh, so we have this ability now to tag functions as being non-recursive. Non and this, this doesn't just cover direct recursion. I mean, that direct recursion would actually be very interesting because you could see that uh, in the function definition. Um, but uh, it, also hand, it, it, also makes, uh, it also implies something about the lack of any indirect recursion as well. So it says that this func you know, if you have a function that's tagged no recurse, it means the function does not call itself either directly or indirectly. Um, and so this allows us to do certain optimizations that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do, um, like the localization of, of global variables. And so uh, one of the nice things about uh, C++, for example, uh, is that the standard gives us a guarantee that, um, that main is not recursive. Uh, this is sort of an interesting, an interesting fact. So in C, it's perfectly well defined to call main yourself again. Uh, but in C++, uh, it, is, it is not legal to call main again. So, uh, in C++, so uh, Clang, for instance, when you're compiling C++ code, will tag main with no recurse, but not with first C code. OK. Um, so uh, I wanted to mention something about the returned attribute. The returned attribute has been in LLVM for, uh, for a long time. Um, but over the past year or so, uh, we did a bunch of work to uh, take advantage of the, of the attribute in a way that we hadn't before. We taught a lot of IR level optimizations about this attribute. The attribute says that uh, the, the, it's, a, it's a function argument attribute. And it says that the function return value is always equal to that particular function argument. So this implies a bunch of things that you might uh, be able to guess, like you can only have this thing on one function argument in your function. Um, and, and it allows us to essentially look back through uh, functions that have one of these returned arguments. In some sense, like they were bit casts. Like when you're trying to figure out what a value is, you can look back through the function call. Um, there happen to be a lot of functions that return one of their arguments. Uh, this is very common in C++, for example. You have a lot of functions that end up returning uh, a pointer to like the, you know, the this pointer, uh, you know, either at the pointer or by reference. But at the IR level, that's, that's more or less equivalent. Um, and so you end up with a large number of functions that, that, that do this. For all of them that are too large to be inlined, it can actually be quite helpful to uh, have this information. Uh, and so. We've, we've, we've taught a bunch of IR level optimizations uh, about this attribute and, and also how to infer it and, and other things. So one of the, uh, uh, one, well, another, new, another new attribute that, that we have is the convergent attribute. Um, this is important when you're doing uh, GPU uh, cogeneration or SIMT cogeneration. Um, and, and it's, it's an attribute that applies to, to, in some sense, special functions like barriers. Uh, and it, it helps us deal with a, with a particular uh, special case that comes up when doing GPU code generation. So uh, when you have, the, there are certain functions when you do GPU code generation, um, like barriers, uh, where you need all of the threads that are executing together on your device to hit the same instruction, like the same barrier instruction. It's not, it's not enough for all the threads to just hit some barrier. They have to hit the same barrier. Um, and it turns out that if you have a, a barrier intrinsic that represents this property, then there are certain optimizations that LVM likes to do, um, like uh, loop on switching, which will naturally break this, this property that, that, you, that you need. And so um, LVM now understands uh, this, this barrier attribute, we've tagged a lot of the intrinsics and other things with this property. Um, 
and, and it, it prevents these kinds of transformations from, from taking place. Uh, this is, uh, so, so at, just as a quick example here, um, here's a, a loop with a condition inside. Um, if there's an optimization LVM called loop on switching, which would like to uh, essentially hoist the conditional out of the loop and have the condition on the outside and then have little loops inside, which is generally a more efficient way of representing this code, especially on a, on a CPU, for example. Um, but if you do that, you'll notice that I went from having one barrier to having two barriers. And you know, if, all of the, if all of the threads were, um, uh, if, all, if, all this, if, if not all the threads you know, evaluate the condition in the same way, they have different values of this condition, then now some of them will hit the first barrier, some of them will hit the second barrier, uh, and, and you'll have a problem uh, when you execute on the, on the hardware. Okay. Um, and just quickly, I want to say that, that a bunch of these attributes that we have, like the null and dereferenceable, et cetera, um, we've now added metadata that corresponds to those attributes. Um, in not, I mean, oftentimes, you don't actually get the values you're looking at as function arguments. Sometimes you happen to, you know, they're values that you load from someplace. And so you want to be able to apply the same kind of assumptions to the values that you've loaded, just as though you had gotten them for function arguments. And so we have this corresponding metadata that, that takes care of that situation. Um, another another uh, new piece of metadata that we've, that we've added recently is the unpredictable metadata. Um, so so the, the, un, the unpredictable metadata addresses a, a specific a problem that, 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 we, that, that comes up. Um, there, on, on many modern um, out-of-order processors, uh, it's, it's better to use uh, branches than it is to use selects or conditional moves or whatever you happen to call them on your, on your hardware, uh, so long as the branch is predictable, so long as the branch predictor will generally get that branch correct. Um, if, the, if, if it's not a branch that the branch predictor is going to, if, if the condition is not something that is going to be able to produce a well-predicted branch on the, on the hardware that you're, that you're dealing with, um, then, then it's, it's in those cases better to use selects or conditional moves or something like that. And it's really hard to know just statically whether what's the right thing to do. Um, and so as a result, uh, we, we introduced this unpredictable metadata, which you can put on branches and selects and such, that tells the optimizer that that condition is going to be unpredictable. And um, we also expose this in Clang, so there's a built-in unpredictable, which works just like built-in expect. Um, and and the, the, the backends, like the x86 backend or what have you, you know, will normally prefer branches for these kinds of things. Um, but we'll use conditional moves for, <clears throat> for these conditions when they're, when they're unpredictable. Uh, OK, so <clears throat> just to, uh, to, to um, <clears throat> review slightly, uh, we have an ability to tag loops with metadata. Uh, <clears throat> the way this works is you have LVM loop, and you tag it with metadata on the, uh, on the back edge uh, branch. And this allows you to associate uh, metadata you know, hints or optimization hints or other properties with, with the loop. And so um, we've, we've, uh, we've made some, uh, some additions uh, to this. Uh, some of the hints I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, also, we've added the ability to put a source code identification uh, marker in the uh, loop metadata. This actually turns out to be really important when we're uh, generating uh, optimization remarks and other kinds of uh, feedback from the optimizer because the user needs to know what, you know, if, you, if you're optimizing a loop and you want to say something about that and pass that information back up to a user or some tool or what have you, then you need to be able to identify what loop you're talking about. Um, and so uh, we had some heuristics that, would, that used to do this based on debug info locations of other things in the loop or in the pre-header. And this didn't really work very well, especially not for nested loops. So, uh, so we now have the, this loop ID metadata. You can actually just put the debug location in there. And that will let you know where the loop was <clears throat> in the source code. Um, I, uh, if, you're, if, if this uh, it all interests you and you want to learn more, um, Adam Nemitz giving a, a, a talk uh, tomorrow on compile-assisted performance analysis. I recommend you attend that. 
Um, OK, so the loop ID metadata can have a whole bunch of, of different optimization hints. Uh, we've had some of these for quite some time. Um, we've also added a few others uh, in the relatively recent past. Uh, we have loops that, that specifically can control runtime loop unrolling, partial loop unrolling. Uh, we have uh, some metadata that can enable the loop distribution pass um, and, and some others. And we've also added some of the corresponding Clang loop pragmas that, that will generate these things. Um, another, another piece of metadata that's, that's been added uh, recently is this invariant group metadata. Um, this, this, uh, this, this metadata, and there's an associated intrinsic uh, called an invariant group barrier, um, was, was added uh, to provide a kind of restricted invariance region for, for memory values. Um, so it says that if you have a pointer and you have multiple loads and stores to it or what have you, uh, and they have the same group tag, then the, ha the, the value in that, in that memory doesn't, doesn't change. Um, this this uh, was added, the specific motivation for this had to do with devirtualization. Um, and uh, there's a, the, if you're interested in this, I recommend there's a, there's a talk um, later this afternoon, I think at noon, uh, on devirtualization LLVM that we'll talk a whole lot more about this feature. Um, the, uh, there, well, we, uh, I'm going to move on to just talking about uh, some, uh, some intrinsics that, that have been added uh, to support vectorization. Um, the, some hardware now uh, supports uh, masked or predicated vector loads and stores. Um, this, um, uh, this is quite an important feature for, for SIMD hardware. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more uh, SIMD instruction sets that support these kinds of features. Um, when you have a, a load or a, uh, or a store and in, a, in a loop that you're trying to vectorize, and that load or store happens only conditionally within the loop, this traditionally has been a really hard thing for a vectorizer to deal with uh, because it doesn't know, I mean, in C or C++ anyway, like we don't know how long the arrays are. So it's, we can't speculatively access uh, all of the elements in the, in the array because we don't know where it ends. And the, the condition in the loop may actually be, you know, aside from doing some seemingly useful thing, may also happen to be preventing you from reading off the end of the array uh, dynamically based on the values of some other thing that's, that's going on. Um, and this actually does rarely come up in practice, for what it's worth. So, so this, is, uh, this is one of the reasons why these um, masked uh, loads and stores were introduced. They allow you to vectorize these things by giving you a, um, a mask uh, vector that, that tells you which elements you can actually load and store to. And, and there's now hardware that, that supports this. Uh, we have, uh, there's a corresponding masked intrinsics for a number of other things as well. Um, so there's loads, there's stores. Uh, we also have intrinsics now for scatters and gathers, which um, you know, are, are when you have a, you know, say, a vector you want to store, and you have a vector of pointers, where that's, you know, so that for each vector element, you have a pointer to some different place where you'd like to store each element. They're not necessarily consecutive in memory. Um, I have some quick examples at the bottom of the slide to explain what that means. And, um, and we now have hardware that supports uh, these things. Uh, just as a sort of word of caution uh, about uh, scatter and, and gathers, uh, we do have hardware that now uh, supports these. For instance, the new uh, you know, AVX 512 instruction set uh, that's supported by the Intel Knights landing chips has you know, scatter and gather uh, uh, support. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the performance of these features is still variable on the, on the hardware itself, so it's not a guarantee to better performance even if the hardware supports it, but um, nevertheless, this is... That, that's how you can expose the feature semantically, because there's no other IR that you can write which easily expresses the same underlying semantics. Um, I want to quickly mention uh, some, some attributes that are going away instead of being added. Uh, so um, uh, we used to support uh, fast math and other kind of floating point math assumptions, uh, like there are no NANDs or no infinities or what have you, uh, by adding attributes to functions. Um, and, and it turns out, however, that this, 
This doesn't really work as well as you might like. It doesn't interact very well with link time optimization, because either you have to prevent inlining when these attributes don't match, or you inline, but then you lose the assumptions, or unfortunately gain assumptions that you didn't have before. Uh, so uh, what we've done is we've moved these flags onto the uh, instructions themselves. So, um, and so the old attributes still exist. You'll still see them in IR. Uh, but the preferred way of representing these when possible is on the, on the functions themselves. There are these flags like no NANDs and no infinities. And then there's fast at the bottom, which implies all the others. Uh, you, I don't have this in the example, but you can combine them as well. You can like, list multiple of them for each instruction. Um, OK. And um, OK. So uh, I'm just going to sort of uh, quickly encourage you, encourage you if you're, um, you know, if you have a, 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 a JIT infrastructure or uh, some other uh, kind of, um, you know, not C or C++ language where it's useful for you to be able to associate metadata with, with particular functions. We now have a couple of features in LLVM that support this. One is called prefix data, which gives you a way of uh, tagging functions with metadata. Uh, we also have prolog data, which allows you to insert uh, sort of code blobs at the beginning of functions in some fairly generic way. Um, and, uh, and that's where I'm going to end, because I'm now out of time. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. And uh, we may have a minute or so for questions. We're going to have time just for one question. Anyone? Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question. Do we recognize all these attributes on the library calls, like printf or scanf? No. <laughs> uh, so where applicable, uh, we do add these attributes to certain calls. Um, we also have. Uh, a, um, we also recognize via the target library inter in info interface uh, s a lot of known function calls and specifically perform optimizations on them, add attributes. Like we know what malloc is and free and you know, things like that. Uh, things like printf are actually surprisingly difficult because depending on the format string, they can read and write data from lots of different places. And uh, they, they, they tend to be quite difficult to optimize around. It's sort of because of corner cases. But we, we, can add, we do add attributes in, in some cases, but it, it turns out to be more restricted than you'd like. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure Hal will be happy to answer questions on the side. <laughs> That's all right. No, okay. All right. Thank you.